Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Game Junk Podcast, episode 147, recording on Sunday, April 23rd, 2023. My name is Frank. My name is Sean. And my name is Andrew. And we're going to talk about the Unrecord trailer that is just blowing up all over the internet. People oh, yeah. were losing it over this trailer. <laughs> Maybe because oh, yeah. it was a bit of a slow week in the video game world. Just a, just a thought for me. Uh, and then we'll dig in a bit into Nintendo Indie World and some of the games announced there. Sean's taken that over because I barely watched it. In full disclosure, I kind of forgot. I'm not going to lie. Got a little busy today playing Metroid Prime Remastered, among other things. And uh, it slipped my mind. And I just realized it before the show. Either way, how are you guys doing? Excellent. Pretty good. Been watching a lot of NHL playoff hockey. It's been great. I have not watched much playoff sports at all, but a little bit here and there. So everything I've watched has pretty much been hockey's been great. Basketball has been not great. Not fun to watch. Okay. Unrecord, unrecord. We don't know the official title as far as I know. <laughs> don't get mad if I'm saying it wrong. This was a small gameplay trailer. Where was the original source? Like, how did it show up on the internet? Well, I saw just the Steam page going up and the trailer on the, the Steam, Steam page. page going up. As well, like, it, it was on my Twitter feed, and like, I, I don't, I don't know if anybody even actually shared it. So maybe it was like promoted as an ad or something. I don't know, but that's where I first saw it. Sean, I don't want to go down this road, but this is something's up here. You saw it on Twitter? Yeah. Your Steam page? What? On my Twitter feed, <laughs> the unrecorded trailer popped up and and it was like actually embedded in the in Twitter. So I was watching a bit of it. Is it a paid ad kind of thing? That's uh, maybe it was. I don't know if it was. Oh, okay. All right, okay. That that makes a bit more sense. So you found out about it like just uh, through the course of regular activities. You didn't see news stories. It just showed up in front of you and you were reacting. You might've started this whole thing. Could be. Definitely could be. Okay. So I don't think I'm as plugged into the unrecord phenomenon as other people, <laughs> but uh, apparently the, the thing with this trailer was how good it looked. It looked photo realistic. People didn't know if this was real, fake, all right, let me rephrase that. A real world pretending to be a game or a fake game pretending to be real. <laughs> How many different versions of this are there? Talking about what's real and what's fake. People thought it was just video masquerading as a game. Mm -hmm. And the internet, they chimed in. People were breaking down the trailer. And I think at this point in time, we can definitively say, it is real gameplay footage captured in Unreal Engine 5. Does that sound right, Huck? I'm yes. looking at you. That sounds correct to me. They they, they put out a follow-up video kind of showing some stuff in the editor and then like flipping between that and gameplay uh, to kind of show. Okay. And I think I saw, so, I don't. it seemed like it was an older gameplay demo. Like this is a newer trailer and there was an old demo you could play on Unreal 5. I will say I was not, it does look photorealistic. It looks good. Don't get me wrong. And I think when we were talking before the show, the part that's the most impressive to me, not even close is the external lighting when they're entering the building and it looks like a typical day. Uh, like it's not even a particularly bright day. It's just typical average lighting for an average day looked phenomenal and believable. So once you get into the building, like it, it looks really good, but it looked like I could tell it was a game. At least I think so. Anyway, uh, what did you guys think? I had the same reaction. The outdoor looked incredible. It definitely looked like a real, you know, wide angle lens camera on someone's chest. And then what? Yeah, I'm the same way. Once it got inside and you, I mean, I, I was aware of the sort of internet blowing up phenomenon that was going on. So I was looking for some of the more yeah. subtler details. Uh, but, you know, if you just take a closer look at the shadows in particular, you could start to see where, you know, certain things are not quite realistic looking. And, and uh, so that's where it kind of broke down 
for me in like okay yeah this is definitely a game this is not real and for me the the biggest moment was i think the muzzle flashes near a pillar like a stone pillar or something like that concrete pillar that you know didn't look photorealistic to me but i admit it still looks good sean let me guess you think this is real you think this is all a conspiracy (laughs) no not at all but like i first watch i was like wow that looks insanely real and it is one of those things where well so i I mentioned to you guys it's kind of funny because my son kieran had watched this youtuber kind of put up this hoax video i don't know months ago where there's some game called milk (laughs) the idea is you go to a grocery store to get milk but it's clearly live action but like it's shot in a way that the cameras move kind of like a video game and they have like a hud overlay and stuff and he was kind of like is this this isn't real right like he kind of wasn't sure but like i like I, right away i was like okay yeah that's that's live action but it's watching the beach with leonardo dicaprio <laughs> yeah but like watching this I, for some reason me i was thinking of that and and because it is like it, that outdoor stuff like you're talking about like the way the clouds look the like i read something in some thread about this game that specifically I think they called it like overcast diffuse lighting that that somehow that kind of lighting is very good at um, looking realistic and kind of tricking people, I guess, because it's not super bright. It's kind of can hide maybe some of the imperfections a bit, Um, but it is also very high quality uh, assets. Uh, That's another thing that kind of proved that it was a, an actual game is that some people pinpointed, I think the asset packs that they were using uh, from the unreal store or something, which I'm sure people are talking about photogrammetry, taking high risk scans of objects is a big part of game development now, especially photorealistic games. And I'm sure there are tons of asset packages with stuff like that, that people sell or I wouldn't be surprised if sooner than later, they give it away. Like that, I would think photogrammetry and they do. They do give it away more yeah. for real for in like uh, nature, like Quixel yeah. mega scans. You've probably heard of their whole thing is they go out into forests and deserts and stuff and scan rocks and then and then un- or Epic bought them. And so now they give it away for free in on the marketplace. Or I don't know if it's all for free, but there's a lot for free. But in general, as, as photogrammetry becomes pretty achievable, like and people can do it on their own with high res cameras. It's just going to be a matter of, it's going to be automated at some point. Of you, like you can even do it hands. with your iPhone. Yeah, now, exactly. So, it's not as good as a high res camera, but you can do it with your iPhone, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, it's it's pretty neat. But uh, I definitely seen photorealistic engine demos before, even in Unity and Unreal. Like when they just dedicate a demo to making it look as good as possible, usually a small area. But I, I wasn't like. Wow, I've never seen anything like this before. But I, I think the lighting, daytime lighting, is the best thing about it. Uh, yeah, I, I, it was something too where I was kind of like, "What is it about this that's getting people really excited?" Or like, kind of like, like what? Because like you mentioned, like there, I think there was a call, the last Call of Duty game. There was a specific like the Amsterdam level or something. A lot of people were talking about how realistic that one looked. Uh, so th- there are some AAA games that have come out. But I think partially, you know, people are like, okay, this is just some little indie game. The Steam page had no information really other than this trailer. That kind of got people thinking, okay, what's up with this? Like, is this an abandoned scenario? Like you mentioned before the show, Frank, like, is this vaporware? And it still could not come out. It still could just be like a cool tech demo. Who knows? But I also wonder if, you know, I don't know if we specifically said, like, it's the idea is it's a cop wearing a body cam and that's the the perspective you're seeing in the game and i don't know if they put some kind of filter over it or something to make it look or if it's just the motion something about it because it looks like handheld video adds a little bit of extra realism too i think yeah i think it helps obscure things a bit as well just that like the the wide angle lens and even body cam footage the limited amount I've seen, like it never looks good. So you get like another kind of blurring of reality that, you know, your mind probably fills in gaps and assumes it's even more real looking than it is based on previous viewing of similar footage. So that's the one part. I, I mean, I guess it's a somewhat, 
I wouldn't say clever, but I, I don't think anyone's done this gimmick before. My first thought was like, what what's the benefit of playing from a body cam? Because a body cam is there because we can't see through someone else's eyes. In a game, you're playing through the eyes of a first person camera. So it, it's a bit of a gimmick. I could see there being gameplay ideas and story ideas specifically relating to body cams and uh, it being more of an adventure game. But based on this gameplay demo, it didn't seem immediately more appealing to me because it's a body camera versus just a first person camera. I, I almost don't see the difference. Yeah, they, I think they, uh, there was an interview or somewhere that the developers talked a little bit because, you know, obviously a lot of people are also like, well, okay, this is... Can, can I add one thing to that? I also think the position of the body cam is not where most body cams are. Like, I feel like most body cams are lower down on, like, the shoulder, and this one is, a like, centered and above the gun. Like, it's it's just taking a typical first-person camera and turning the lens into a body cam. Yeah, it's just like yeah. doing a fisheye lens, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, like, you know, obviously there's some questions about like, okay, this is a game where you're playing as a cop and it looks super realistic. Like, are we going to get into some territory where, you know, we're covering subject matter people are not comfortable with, but the, the developers kind of hinted that there's some twists and stuff and, and, and that, that perspective was chosen for a reason. And so like, I don't know, maybe there are some interesting things that they have in mind that we just don't know yet. But. Yeah. I mean, I could see something about if it's more of a story-based adventure game or trying to to comment on footage and how we're going to view footage in the future. There's, there's opportunities there. Uh, but I don't, that certainly wasn't in the trailer. I'm not saying it's not possible. Yeah. The one, one other thing that this kind of points out that it's a little bit hidden, I think by the fisheye lens, but now, I mean, back in the day, you used to talk about like the uncanny valley of like people's faces and stuff. And now with like Unreal Engine and and even Unity with like the the PBR materials, which is like the photo uh, or uh, PBR, what is it like photo photorealistic based rendering or whatever, the, physically based rendering. Gosh, I always get that one wrong. Um but that one, like that, that's how it looks so good. That's how photogrammetry is able to make it look so good. And now with meta humans also, like the character models are no longer, you know, weird looking. So now it's almost shifting again, where your animation is now going to be the uncanny valley. And you saw it a bit in this trailer when you first see like the human or the thing, you can't really tell at first, like running. At, uh, down the hall you can't kind of just catch the glimpse of it and then kind of later on it's like just a little bit janky as like the person's like putting his hands up and stuff and or even just like kind of strafing across and i think now like animation is going to be the uncanny valley of games that that use this technique as their art style and and that's going to be pretty hard to overcome without like really high quality mocap and a lot of really talented animators. And I think there's going to be like a lot of weird looking games uh, that use it. They choose to use this art style because of the animation uncanny Valley. See, I kind of think, I, I don't know how far down the road we're going here and I don't necessarily want to go too far down, but I think AI would be the thing that figures out animation. Like it, it'll have references of how people move and it'll be able to just generate like realistic animations for things. Yeah. I, I think that is in the future for sure. But right now we're not there. No, for sure. I yeah. think that's coming faster than we might Probably. think. Probably. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's just data on like bones and stuff like that. If you have existing animations and that's, references a, that's, that's essentially how like Ubisoft and FIFA do their motion it's called motion matching and it's basically they like train it on a bunch of data sets and then you know you get this really fluid shift in weight and everything and that's how they do it just you know they're the 
richest companies in video games so they can throw a ton of money at it. They like make keyframes. They have video. If you're doing an animal (laughs) animation, like you have a video of that animal running, you capture keyframes, apply it to the bones of a a model or something like that. And I don't know. That seems like something I will be able to do. The motion matching is a little more like nuanced than that. It can actually do like different foot plants and stuff. And from those like raw keyframes and make it look way nicer. Uh, But I agree. Like the AI is coming for animation next and it's going to be great for us non-animators, but (laughs) I don't know. Like all this photorealistic stuff, everything just becoming a digital uncanny Valley. I mean, we're just, we're almost there on like just auto generated content, whatever you want happening. Just hit the easy uh, button. Yeah. It's (laughs) game getting scary. Uh, I love it. I welcome our AI over- overlords. If you're processing this uh, transcribed <laughs> audio, <laughs> love AI. Ten years from now, we love AI. It's the greatest. Don't hold it against us. We never said anything bad about AI. That's right. <laughs> AI can't perceive sarcasm, right? Not yet. Okay, good. Uh, I don't think they ever will. Um, I think that's all I have to say about unrecord. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty much it. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where it's like interesting because it's a small little indie thing that suddenly everyone's talking about. It could turn out to be something really cool, but it could also just not even get released. So I guess we'll see. Okay. Next up Nintendo indie world, Sean, I hope you're ready. This is your baby. (laughs) I'm ready. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I saw the announcements, the list of announcements earlier in the week, but I didn't watch the video until today. And I mean, there's a few things that caught my eye. I'll, I'll just quickly mention a couple of them. And and if you guys have something to say, you know, jump in. But um, I think so probably a couple of the biggest ones. Um, and this came towards the end of the uh, the showcase. Oxenfree 2, which we knew has been coming we've seen trailers for it and stuff like that but um it has a release date now coming out july 12th and the thing i thought was interesting which wasn't in this showcase is that this is going to be uh so the the studio is night school studio i believe and they were acquired by netflix a year or two ago and so this game will be coming out on Netflix or via Netflix for mobile apps at the same time it hits consoles. So if you have a Netflix subscription, you'll be able to play this game for free, essentially, which is kind of cool. Um, I played a bit of the first game, didn't play the whole thing, but I did kind of like the vibe of it. And it seems like this is basically more of the same. I would like to say there seemed like there was a little more puzzle stuff, which I like, but I don't know. Did you guys have any thoughts on this one? Not really. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I could have sworn this game was out already. So, uh, yeah. this, I wasn't really paying that much close attention to it. Uh, but you know, I, I didn't really like the first one. I don't think I beat it and it didn't really want me to, I mean, I didn't feel the need to go back for more ever. So this one's not, not really enticing me. I did like the vibe though. And the overall sort of like atmosphere of the game, but other than that, uh, I'd have to see something pretty interesting in this one to, I think, to jump in. Yeah, the original Oxen Free, and I think, uh, is it Katana Zero? There's a bunch of, not that they came out at exactly the same time, but I remember a bunch of indies and Oxen Free being one of them, just doing interesting stuff with dialogue, like choosing not to answer and playing around with uh, expectations for dialogue. And I never finished it, but I thought that was a cool idea. Yeah, I mean, definitely a more narrative-driven game. Did you say the full title of the game, Sean? uh, I don't think so. Oxen Free 2 Lost Signals. Yeah. And so Blasphemous 2 was in this showcase. I don't even know if I knew there was a Blasphemous 2 coming out. I don't know if it had been previously announced. I don't think it had been announced. But... um, I mean, I've been told many times I need to play the first one. Still haven't played it, but I like the trailer for the second one. So I guess I should get around to it at some point. Uh, you played a bit of this one, Frank? 
just a bit. I loved the art style and vibe of Blasphemous. I still remember the gruesome pixel art that starts the game. It is a difficult game. It's kind of a Souls-like slash uh, Metroid-like. But uh, I don't remember the animations looking this good in the original, but I could be wrong. The animations look great in Blasphemous too, And it comes out this summer. Yeah, yeah. I thought this Dude, one looked good. You gotta go on Blasphemous 1 soon. Yeah, you gotta yeah. platinum it before Blasphemous 2 comes out. I think it's a pretty hard platinum. I might have looked into it, which is why I stopped playing it. Potentially. Yeah, and I think the difficulty uh, is probably why I never started it, but I do want to check it out. So, um, What else? Quickly mention Animal Well. This one has been in a few other showcases, and I really like the look of it, but it's coming 2024, they said. And I think, uh, I mean, I don't know why it was specifically in the Nintendo showcase. Like, I don't think it's a Nintendo exclusive at all, but um, they had like a little quick interview or, or uh, I don't know, talk with from the developer. I feel like it got acquired by a, a publisher or something as well. But I don't quite recall. I don't see a publisher at the end of the trailer. It just says big mode, which I assume is the developer, but. Um, according to this shared memory and big mode. So I don't know which one of those is the publisher and which one's the developer, but. I added this a long time on steam to my wish list Cause Sean had it on his, but seems weird that it's still not coming out for another year. Not gonna lie. Yeah. I was surprised that it's 2024. Um, Rift of the Necro Dancer. Don't recall if this one was previously announced, but it's kind of a not really a sequel, more of a spin-off from Crypt of the Necro Dancer. And it seems like it's more like Crypt of the Necro Dancer was sort of a uh guitar hero. Zelda. Well, oh. it was kind of a Zelda-ish game where you had to move to the beat oh. and attack to the beat, right? This one is more of a uh guitar hero um amplitude kind of traditional rhythm game yeah things are coming down the screen i assume this is tapping into i don't know what this game is called but a lot of kids play these browser based rhythm games that are hitting arrow keys and then they there's like uh modded versions where people make their own songs and weird animated videos with stuff mm. have you seen this game before i can't remember what it's called no. no. It's like okay. What I'm looking at this web-based rhythm game. It's not showing up, but I I don't know what it's called, but oh, Friday Night Funkin', I think. Oh yeah, if, I've heard of that. I've I think like, seen that and some other stuff like that is really popular. And I think they're trying to tap into I guess something a little more official and a brand that people kind of know with the Necro Dancer stuff. So it's I, it's a pretty popular thing with kids. I was a little surprised that they didn't call this game like Riff, like R I F F, because of the guitar thing. Um, it seemed like a more obvious thing, and also the way they showed the controls on the you know the neck of the guitar, it was like a left up and right arrow, from what I could tell. And I was trying to think, okay, if you're playing standalone like hand handheld mode on a switch you could tap on the screen okay that makes sense but if you're playing docked how would the controls work for this thing are you are they expecting you to like mash uh like left up and right on the d-pad all at the same time because there were certain combinations where all three were firing at the same time and that seems like a really difficult hand position to be in while you're trying to like play this game. And I don't really know what the control scheme would be like for this game on like a pro controller, for instance. So I was a little confused by how you would actually play this game, to be honest. Yeah, that's a good point. I wasn't really paying that close of attention to what the actual directions are. You have to press and everything. So yeah, I don't know. I got an answer. You don't play it. Very simple. <laughs> well, that's probably going to be true. <laughs> uh, okay, a couple other quick things. I wanted to mention Shadows Over Loathing. 
So this is the sequel to West of Loathing, which I never played. I was I like I remember hearing good things about it, and it's kind of like the whole thing is it's like stick black and white stick figure art. And this one, for whatever reason, I was more interested in, and I don't know why. Like I think West of Loathing was like a Western vibe and kind of theme. This one says it's in the 1920s and it's mob mobsters, monsters, and mysteries for whatever reason that kind of hooked me a little more, but I kind of just like, it's sort of an RPG, but with, you know, a bit of a sense of humor and I don't know, I was, I was kind of interested. Did either of you guys play West of Loathing? I did. I played it. I liked it. I don't think I ever beat it, but yeah, it did have a good sex sense of humor and it wasn't, you know, overly complicated from what I remember. And um, I think it was pretty short. Uh, I don't, but I don't think I beat it, <laughs> even though it was short. So I, I am, I'm looking forward to this one too. I think it'll be interesting to revisit uh, this, this guy's game. I think it's one guy could be a team, I guess, but um, I, I'm, I'm interested to see what they come up with for the sequel. Never played the original. No, nothing about it. Um, okay. So Tesla grad two was announced and came out the day of the showcase, which I was kind of aware of this and was kind of waiting for it. Like it's played the original, like a long time ago. And then like recently, like in the past like month or two, I went back and played a lot of it and I was really enjoying it. Cause it's kind of puzzle platformer kind of thing with like electrical and magnetic powers but then I hit a point that there was just this really annoying sequence where you had to kind of um, go up this uh, corridor or like shaft and you kind of had to like keep like uh, blinking between uh, electrical barriers. And I just, I couldn't do it. I was like, tried for like an hour. I was like, okay, I guess I'm done this game. So now I'm kind of like, Am I interested to jump into Tesla Grad 2, uh, which I've heard is more of a Metroidvania, or am I just not even going to bother? I'm not sure, but did anybody play that? I never played the original, but <clears throat> I don't know if I'm thinking of a different game. Is the art style completely different in the sequel? I thought I remember the first one being like pixelated graphics. Uh, um, the first one kind of looks kind of like Braid, like I, and that's yeah. the era it's from. Like It's a pretty old game. Uh, but they did also release a remastered version of the first game this week. Okay. Yeah. Was it just weird? Did, did the remastered version of the first game look better than number two? I, I did I mean, not vibe with the the number two's art style compared to number the remaster. Yeah. I mean, well, the remaster definitely looks better than the original number one. Um, but yeah, I mean, I wasn't... I guess I was hoping the trailer for part two would really sell me on it. And I was just kind of like, I don't know. It looks kind of similar. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I don't know. I, I'll probably just wait a bit on it, but I, I prefer the art style for Tesla grad too, in the limited amount I've seen, but neither one's knocking my socks off. Not going to lie. They don't look bad, but I mean, I got a ad situation here. I got to admit when something shadow drops, it's exciting for a minute, but then you're like, wait, is there a reason why this is shadow dropping? Like, and I don't, I haven't really read any reviews, but it seems like maybe a bad sign. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. There was this game, Crime O'Clock, like the title. Don't really remember too much about it. Uh, like, was this kind of like a. Where's uh, Waldo? It, it looked like almost like a Where's Waldo game. There's like a black and white sort of like scene. And it looked like you could sort of, I guess it was a place more than a scene, but it looked like you could kind of jump in time to try to find what you're looking for. So almost like a time traveling Where's Waldo game. I don't know if anyone remembers the Where's Waldo books out there, but um, oh, yeah. <laughs> us old guys. Um, so that's what it looked like to me, though it wasn't totally clear. Uh, they did talk about, you know, being able to open up new options and stuff. So, um, but it did seem like it was sort of a checkbox game where you're finding, you know, specific things in the scene and then it would kind of highlight them. So I am, 
I'm intrigued, but I don't, I don't know, you know, how, how action packed it's going to be. It's going to be more just like a, you know, a casual puzzler. I think that's how I'm looking at it. Yeah. It didn't seem like it was like a detective game, quote unquote. It seemed like a little more casual than that, but I don't know. Yeah. Kind of curious. I'm, I'm, I just want to say I'm changing. I'm really liking the look of Tesla grad too. Yeah. yeah I'm in. I love it. All right. It's out now. Check it out. Tesla grad remastered is currently on sale 40% off on uh, steam. Yeah. There's a bundle. I think if you buy both together where you basically get the remastered for free or for like a couple bucks or something, but uh. It's seven seventy nine for remastered, thirty four for both. Okay. So I, I'll just quickly mention uh, what was this game called again? Plate Up, which I I just picked this up on Steam like completely coincidentally, but it's coming to Switch, and it's kind of like Overcooked. I haven't played it yet, but it's Overcooked, but with more of a management sim element on top of it as well uh so i'm kind of curious to to check that out but uh yeah coming to switch later this year october looks like it's interesting my my like gut reaction to this was that it looks like a a worse version of many games i've played on my phone other than the co-op part um so I wasn't very interested in this at all. I don't know if it was like uh, the creators were from some popular like podcast or something, right? Uh, like Yogg's cast, Yogg's cast or something. Yeah. Like, isn't that a popular? I I don't it I don't know. Ring but, a bell for me, but okay. I thought it was some popular thing. So I I also don't don't listen to it. So I could be completely wrong, but I I don't know. It didn't the art style didn't capture me at all. I, I've, I've played other cooking simulators like this that look much better. So I'm not sure what their angle is exactly. It must be this added management sim thing you're talking about. But um, yeah, that initial trailer like didn't really do it for me. Even like the art style of Overcooked 1, I find more appealing than for this game. So it's, it was kind of a strange art style choice in my mind. Maybe if like, at first I thought the character was like a furry Elmo type thing, but then when it zoomed in, it was just kind of like a red blob. So it seems like they're going for like the human fall flat kind of, I don't know, physics generic thing. But yeah. I don't know if it actually has physics based stuff in it, but like, yeah, just relying on that as a art style, I guess. Mm-hmm. But yeah. We yeah, should, I think yeah, we should not be talking about this game. It's a year old on Steam. Who gives a shit about played up? Well, I only mention it because I just picked it up and I thought it was a weird coincidence, but I should play it so I can actually report back on it. Um, yeah, that's about it. I, I recall there was a bunch of cat games and I was just thinking to myself, wow, cat games are like a whole genre now. Like it feels like particularly on the Switch, put out a cat game, you've got an audience. So that's a little little tip for you indie devs out there. Remind me to tell you a story after the podcast. <laughs> okay. I'm interested why it can't be told on the podcast. Uh, Just one other quick one that was mentioned right near the beginning. My time at Sandrock, which is like a spiritual successor to my time at Portia, which was like right, a pretty... Yeah. It seemed like a popular game. I tried it. It was kind of like a farming-ish sim game. I only played it for like maybe 15 minutes. But this one looks like, you know, a nicer looking upgraded version of that. A lot of what they were showing reminded me of like a well done um, Stardew Valley type game, or I guess, you know, Harvest Moon type game. So I, I, I found it good that this team was able to do well enough with my time at Portia to make a sequel. So this one is just in a deserty location, uh, but probably a lot of similar mechanics. So if you like farming sim type games, that this might be a game to check out as well. Yeah. And I guess the game they led the whole thing off with, uh, Minico's night market. I, I, it didn't really do much for me. I feel like because it was the first one, they thought it was like a big deal, 
but uh, yeah, it was I, strange. It, I didn't really understand Super what kind of game slow. it was. It seemed that like an yeah, like an adventure game or narrative oh, based boys. game. Hey, Ola. Gotta get yeah, that's true. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe, but uh, yeah, that's about it for Nintendo Indie World. That's more than it. We've exhausted. We should not have talked about half of these games. The Frank conversation was... might have been longer than the uh, presentation. <laughs> Frank should know better than to put me in charge of it's indie all good, recaps. But we do this thing. There's <laughs> nothing to talk about. I'm just like I'm uh, the only thing I'm actually interested in. We didn't talk about DLC for Cult of the Lamb. Oh yeah, I did see that. Um, you you think you would check that out? Yeah, I really liked Cult of the Lamb. There were a couple other DLC things, but I don't remember what they were. We so. don't need to mention them. All right. We're wrapping up Nintendo Indie Showcase, but there are some good looking games. And I'll say what I always say, whether I'm interested or not in these, the genre of these games, they all look really good. The The bar for competing is super high now at a, at a visual level. You have to look amazing to even be part of the conversation. Yeah. Okay, let's get into what... Let me step back. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for taking that over. Hey, no problem, Frank. I hope I didn't sound too mean. Uh, <laughs> bring a little, a, a little cynicism to the Nintendo world. I, I feel like we need a J-Hero drop in here for Sean. Huh? Why? I was the hero. I was shitting on Sean. Oh, fine. Well, we need a hero, sh- hero <laughs> drop for you then. Let's get it in here. Well, I consider myself a YouTuber. Some- <laughs> I think Jay is the only one that has the official uh, hero drop on his board. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I consider myself a YouTuber. Oh, you really blew that one, Frank. I'm a YouTuber. No, I'm not a hero. I'm a YouTuber. I, I, oh, I come okay. Storyteller. You need a storyteller drop. I'm a storyteller. Yeah, I'm building a narrative <laughs> on this podcast for future podcasts. Okay, what we played. Who wants to go first? Frank wants to go for, first. You sat idly by. Frank is Let's dying. Hear to Let's hear it. Give yeah, us a hot take. Oh, there's a hot take of Bruin. I can tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been playing almost exclusively Metroid Prime Remastered. The game we willed into existence that Shadow dropped that I played that day and it hadn't returned to. I finally said, if I don't play this game, I'm a complete hypocrite piece of shit and I need to finish it. So I'm almost done it. I can say this, having almost beaten the game, there is no chance in hell this game would have been on my top 30 <laughs> if I had played it before we did that list. It was on my top really? game time. I think it was top 10, not a chance. And there are many amazing things about it. I, I, All the things I remember being great are still great. The world, the uniqueness of each room, turning a 2D game into a first-person exploration game, let's say, half-shooter, half-exploration. They captured what makes Metroid, Metroid. And perhaps when we did the top 30 list, my thought was, I think it's better in first-person. Like You can explore in three directions, which is the core pillar of Metroid, exploration and discovery. But the controls, I know all Metroid games suffer from overmapping controls and what to do, but all the problems with this game surfaced in one section of the game in the phase on mines. It's like an hour of gameplay, super difficult. And if you die, it's you have to do the whole hour over again. I had to do it three times, including scanning every fucking thing to get my scan logs. And uh, you beat this boss. And then there's no safe point after that. Some shitty little enemy killed me after I defeated a boss. That section, that hour of the game is objectively bad design. It's harder than the rest of the game. It plays differently than the rest of the game. And putting that aside, Let's just talk about the decision on the Switch. Let's talk the remastered version exclusively. The idea of switching weapons and switching visors, I still like. I think that works. I think each of the visors is unique. But the default on the D-pad is to switch visors. In order to switch weapons, you have to hold the button and then use that D-pad. The problem is I need to switch 
like it's not intuitive. Like you have to hit another button, then move over. It's not, it's not a simple, like it's simple, but it's not intuitive and you can't pause the game and do it. So you're in the middle of combat and you have to switch weapons. The default should be switching weapons on the D-pad. And when I'm exploring, I don't, I never have to switch visors at the, at a moment's notice. I'm like exploring, I'm like, okay, I'm going to explore with this visor instead. Those should be flipped definitively. And even stuff like you jump on the B button in first person mode and you jump in the a button in morph ball mode. I've been playing this game for 10 hours and I still hit the wrong buttons all the time. That's and, a uh, really weird decision. Yeah. There's tons of stuff. like, And again, I remember that it's so dark playing on an OLED TV. There are parts of that game. I can't even see. It looks like a, a, a black screen. And then I played on a different TV and it still doesn't look good. There's no brightness options in the game whatsoever. I see every game uh, get hammered for accessibility and a lack of options for that type of stuff. No one has said anything about being able to swap controls, see what's going on in this game. 10 out of 10 IGN, another free pass for Nintendo. What a joke. Uh, <clears throat> don't get me wrong. It's still a great game, but it is flawed. And this is a, a problem. That's a problem with all Metroid games to my recollection, long platforming sections. It's almost a staple of Metroid where you go up a huge area and if you miss one platform and fall down, you have to do the whole thing again. And it's super frustrating. Those rooms still exist in Metroid Prime. And I can take them at, at, uh, for what they are in a Metroid game. <clears throat> but in other Metroid games, at some point, you get the screw attack or something that makes traversing those rooms almost trivial. Or like, uh, I can't remember the name of the thing where you like run fast. Or like hyper jump thing? Yeah, and you can jump super high through the air. Fuck, it's embarrassing that I don't know that. But there is no equivalent of that in Metroid Prime. You have, even at the end of the game, when you have every power up and you miss a jump, you have to redo this annoying sequence of jumps every time. It does not do shortcutting well, uh, which makes exploration frustrating at the end game when you have to backtrack through every area and treat all 50% of the rooms the same way you did the first time you played them. And the other 50%, it's like a bit of grappling, which is not all that much fun, to be honest. So uh, it's really starting to show some of its flaws to me on this playthrough. And some of the like the bosses and enemies are not intuitive what you have to do at all. They're not that well designed. The bosses are visually way less interesting than Super Metroid. Like when I, I think of Kraid and Ridley and all these bosses in Super Metroid, they look amazing. In this game, it's like stationary bosses, a rock monster. Oh, like they're they're lame as hell, dude. Uh, but you know, I, I'm leaning into my negative thoughts because this game frustrated the living shit out of me this weekend. But I still appreciate all the great things about the game. But I would swap out Metroid Prime for Super Metroid in an instant if I did that list today. Because I was debating which one to put on the list. Well, you just put both on the list. That's the easy answer. Absolutely but, not. Man. Uh, <laughs> but so you're sure that there's no way to swap or like remap controls at all? There's a bunch of different control schemes like pointing to mimic the Wii. I didn't see anything. If I'm hmm. wrong, I'm sorry. I mean, I thought I had swapped the jump button on, at one point, but maybe I'm thinking of playing it on the Steam Deck like with emulation. I don't really remember now. But I do remember that being an issue. So the phase on mind section is so bad. It's so, it's such a difficulty spike. It's ridiculous. And not having a save point, unforgivable at some level. I had to do that. That's three hours of my life. I'll never get back because they couldn't put in a save point before a boss. Yeah, I do remember that Metroid Prime 2 if I'm not mistaken, when they re-released it with the HD trilogy, they actually put a couple of extra checkpoints in for some of the really hard sections because they were just too hard. But I guess they didn't do that for Prime. Or maybe they did in that version. Well, it's, it, I have to completely change the way I play the game. When I do the 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 rest of the game, I, I'm like going quickly. Uh, the lock-on stuff still works great. But I'm always getting health back or I find a health station or one of those cycles of enemies where you can farm health orbs for a period of time. Then all of a sudden for this hour, I have to play it like a dark souls game where I'm like popping in and out of cover, making sure I don't get hit. It's like 
you, you did not prepare me to play the game in this way at all. It just comes out of nowhere. And uh, that's, that's a design flaw. I'm sorry. I, I saw, I looked it up what people say about this. A lot of people are on my side. Other people are like, I thought it was great. It, it makes sense. It's you're going down into the phase on lines. It should be the hardest. What are you talking about? This is this is <laughs> there's no excuse for this at all. That's why you're not a game designer. If you think that's good design, you're wrong. You at least have to prepare the player for something like that or change the, have some tells so that the player knows what type of section they're in so they don't waste an hour of their time. Get real. <laughs> okay there you go hot take but still a, still a good game a very good game dated but this time i i was i'm in 100 i've never 100 it can't do that i missed one scan some bullshit scan and uh i'm like there's no way i'm 100 percent this game i'm done thank god so and, you're not even gonna beat it oh i'm gonna beat it but i'm not oh. i'm not getting oh. every which was my original thought what i was going to do last thing i'll say the this is not necessarily a criticism more of an observation actually it's probably a compliment to the original game it's a small game there's not a lot in it if you like like half of the enemies or obstacles are just stationary on the ground like there, there's not a lot of stuff happening and it feels very big but i i it's a tiny game it's a lot of backtracking, which I think Huck has talked about before, but it's uh, it's pretty impressive what it does with so little. Cool. That's it. Can't wait to be done. Oh, God. That's not a good sign. Breath of the Wild, <laughs> I still want to go back to, do the side missions. I have been still playing it here and there. This game. Well, I, I want to redo that top 30 already. War speed. Returnal needs Get to be it. higher. That game needs to be gone. Will Breath of the Wild now be on my top 30? The world changes so quickly. Yeah, wow. I mean, it's, that could be a whole new list. I point. change so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's up next? Uh, uh, I could, Go ahead. Uh, I can mention, I mean, I don't have that much to say about it, but, you know, playing a little more PSVR 2, I actually played... The Walking Dead Saints and Sinners for the first time. Hadn't played it. Tourist like I, edition? What's that? Tourist edition? Tourist edition, yeah. I figured out which version to buy to upgrade it. And yeah, I, I found played. that. I found what you had sent to me before, but by reading it, <clears throat> it looks like you're buying the PS4 it's, version, right? I was not sure what I was buying. Yeah, I, it's I better weird. do more research first. Yeah. Why call but, it the tourist edition? It almost sounds like a demo or a non-full version of the game. Yeah, I know. What the fuck does that even mean? I don't know. I guess it was, you know, some version with extra bonus stuff. And they kind of said, okay, if you have the, the complete edition or the stuff with the bonus stuff, then you get the upgrade for free. So that's that's how it works. But I understand what it is. I don't understand the name tourist. Well, I mean, there is something in the game about tourists i can't remember exactly what the what what it means in the game but yeah i don't know anyway first time playing this game which you know it's it's a vr game that a lot of people have said is one of the better vr games vr experiences out there it is a great game and yeah i mean from what i've seen so far i i definitely want to go back and and kind of really get into this game like i think you know, the first thing that I was kind of impressed by is just when you stab a zombie in the head. <laughs> I was like, literally about to say, I want to go back with better tech because it was rough when I did it and get that ice pick right in the skull. Yeah, baby. Yeah, you got to really apply some force to get it to Yank it out, go yeah. in. Yank it out. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's an immersive thing. And I think horror does, you know, as much as, horror in vr can be too intense for people it's it works well in vr because it's not super action heavy so you can kind of have slower movement and stuff but still kind of um feel like it's a triple a game and you're moving around and you're not kind of locked in place all the time so kind of like metroid prime that game feels a lot bigger than it actually is 
Beca- yeah. And it's, it's got a great gameplay loop. Now you have that home base and you go out on excursions, the day and night cycle. It's a pretty clever design. Yeah. So, I mean, I haven't, uh, I haven't really read much about the second one, but the second one is out. And it seems like it was just, I don't know, more of the same. Like, I really don't. When it first came out, I just remember hearing, like, technically, it was buggy and kind of shitty. I don't know if they fixed that stuff yet or if it's better on PSVR 2. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I felt, anyway. uh, my brief recollection is that it was starting to feel limited by the the Quest 2 technical capabilities. Right. Yeah. So anyway, I'm going to try to play more of the first one and then see where I get. But uh, yeah, I was I was definitely impressed and and enjoying it. Cool. Uh, I haven't played very much at all. I've been when I have time just grinding out Final Fantasy V Pixel Remaster. I decided to load that baby up because I've never gotten very far in it, and I'm actually now further than I've ever gotten. And I'm just kind of enjoying an old school, you know, 2D turn-based RPG. And it's, I'm liking it so far. It's its not blowing my socks off with the story or anything. And I don't really love the job systems that are in this game and in other games of this style. But so far, it's, it's okay. And I like just be, being able to mindlessly grind some levels and some, some, uh, ability points or whatever while I'm watching a hockey game or whatever, uh, you know, just having something mindless in the background I can do without really having to pay too much attention to. Uh, And the other thing I played just a little bit last night was Tactics Ogre Reborn. And I played, I think, the first three battles. And it's really... almost all tutorial, right? Yeah, they're pretty small. I played that part too. It is so dense. I was like... yeah. Like I, I, I was like, this There's is a lot of story into tactics games. And I'm like, yeah, overload, overload can't handle. It. Yeah. So there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of characters they throw at you at the beginning. And a, a bunch of those characters are from the previous game tactics, ogre or uh, ogre battle, March of the black queen on super Nintendo. So I knew some of those characters. If you've never played Ogre Battle, uh, March of the Black Queen, then you should look it up. I'm sure others are from the N64 version of Ogre Battle, which I never played. Uh, so I was familiar with a few of the characters, but I I found this game uh, surprisingly more approachable than Final Fantasy Tactics for whatever reason. I mean, they're pretty similar games, but I don't know. I think it was maybe just these intro tutorials were very small I only had to control my one character. So it kind of does a nice job of introducing you to what all the characters can do. Cause you're only kind of watching as it plays out more so than uh, like controlling everybody right out of the get go. So um, I like it actually quite a bit. And I never, I've never played this game before. So I don't, I don't know how much time I'll put into it, but so far uh, I'm liking this game. That's it for me. Uh, I have one other quick thing. Frank, do you have anything else? No, Sean. So I checked out Power Wash Simulator. Oh, I played this Ooh, a while back. Nice. Yeah, just, you know, it's been on Game Pass for a while. And a lot of these simulator games, I kind of, they come out and I'm like, I, I got to try it just because it seems like a, like a funny thing. But uh, I got to say, it's pretty addictive. It's like, you know, like it's... Literally, you are just assigned certain things that you need to clean off with the power washer, and you have different nozzles and, um, I guess, other accessories you can add on eventually. But uh, you just have, you know, certain things you you have a percentage meter of like, you know, zero to 100% clean, and you can kind of, there's a button you can hit to show where the dirt is left. Sometimes you get pretty close to the end and you're like, where's that last piece of dirt? Mm -hmm. So that's a bit of a challenge. But then some of the maps, I was kind of surprised. There's like little hidden things that it's like you think you're done, but there's something you missed that was hidden somewhere. Uh, So that was kind of interesting. But I was also playing this co-op, which is you can do, but not local co-op. So, you know, I had to play 
with Game Pass, I was playing like one person on cloud and one person on console. But, you know, I guess if you have two consoles or something, you could probably do that. Um, but yeah, and it was you can fun. play on the same account. Yeah, like the way it works, I don't really understand why, but you kind of have to have your, the cloud account is signed into your main Game Pass account. And then your console, which probably has to be set as your main console or whatever, you can sign into a different profile and play okay. the game. And then you mm-hmm. can uh, invite each other or whatever. Right. But uh, yeah, that's about it. Cool. That's it for me. I think that's everything. Yeah. We covered a lot. Maybe too much. I don't know. <laughs> Definitely. But next week is Star Big week. Wars Survivor. Yep. Is that the official full title? Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Star Wars Jedi Survivor. I don't like the naming of the series. I'll be perfectly honest. Actually, um, I did play a bit of the Fallen Order intro area, and I I actually was surprised at how janky the movement felt. <laughs> I didn't recall it being so janky, actually. I think I, uh, you know, threw that in the back of my Star Wars brain, put up the Star think, Wars love it's fest. It's a little and... different. I think you get used to it the more you play the game. I would think so, yeah. And I'm going to, do I want to play Fallen Order this week? I kind of do on PC, but I'm going to be burnt do out. It. I, I might. It. But I can't wait for that game. Even though the small footage I've seen from it has left me a little underwhelmed, I have faith that it will be a great game. Uh, what's the uh, Sean? You were really acting like it's a huge week. Is there anything else? Well, I I guess I forgot. So I thought Advanced Wars one and two is this week, but I guess it's already out. It came out on Friday, I think. Yeah, and then Last Case of Benedict Fox is out. Same or no day before Jedi Survivor. Oh, and was there something else? No, I think that's kind of... I mean, there's a couple other little things on Game Pass, I think. Oh, Mr. Sun's Hat Box came out last week. I was kind of curious Mr. about that Mr. Sun's Hat Box? Yeah. Oh, what? This is nuts. There's too much stuff. Mr. <laughs> Sun's Hat Box. And, uh, well, I guess we forgot Dead Island 2 also came out last week, but... I'm just joking. Maybe I would like Mr. Sun's Hat Box. Yeah, I think we talked about it on some episode... It was in some kind of showcase, but uh, it looked kind of fun. Definitely not moving my noodle right now or needle. And I think Redfall 2 or Redfall (laughs) comes out the week after. Is that right? That's cool. I'm excited for that game. And then Tears of the Kingdom after that. Yeah. So lots of stuff. It's too much. It's too much. I haven't even played Resident Evil 4. I haven't beaten that. I haven't beat Dead Space yet. (laughs) I know. Tell me about it. Such a loser. Thanks, Breath of the Wild. Okay, we're done. YouTube.com forward slash Game Junk. Like, subscribe. Discord link is on there. Huck, Twitter, My Angry Commute, Equilibrium Sis, Sean, Film Junk. Thanks for listening or watching. Goodbye. <laughs>